Hello and welcome everybody. I'm uh, Dr. Peter Saunders, the Chief Executive of the International Christian Medical and Dental Association. And today on ICMDA webinars, we've got Professor John Whitehall back speaking to us on the teenage brain and decision making, and I'll introduce him very shortly. ICMDA brings together about 60,000 Christian doctors and dentists from uh, over 80 countries worldwide. And the, uh, the way we'll work today is that John, John will give a, a speak, uh, talk straight to camera. And then uh, for about half an hour, then we'll have a time of question and answer. So uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce John Whitehall again. Hi, John. John is an Australian pediatrician and a professor of child health at Western Sydney University. He's lived and worked in several countries and was until recently National Chair of Christian Medical and Dental Fellowship Australia, CMDFA, which is the ICMDA affiliate in that country. For 15 years, John was a neonatologist in Northern Australia, which sharpened his interest in brain development. And it was actually in 2016 at a physician's meeting he was challenged by a presentation on affirmation therapy for gender dysphoric children, finding he could not accept assurances given that such psychological and hormonal intrusion into the brains of adolescents was safe and entirely reversible and based on appropriate consent. So this presentation on the adolescent brain decision-making uh, builds on that and represents further investigation into those claims. So John, it's a real pleasure to have you back here on ICMDA webinars. Uh, what time is it in Sydney at the moment? Oh, it's only one o'clock. One o'clock in the morning, so. Uh, yeah. Well, brilliant. Well, well, thank you so much for making the time and we really look forward to hearing yeah, what you have welcome. to say and then discussing it. Thank you. Over to you. You're welcome, Peter. It's a privilege to be here. Uh, let me just say that this is a complex subject, and I, I will go slowly for the translator's sake um, and stick to the text rather than uh, complicate the issue of uh, the language. So let me start by referring to the words of St. Paul uh, to the Corinthians. And uh, he explained, when uh, I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now, although we, we accept this as an obvious fact of nature, deeper questions arise. Uh, mechanistically, was this transformation of his and ours uh, the result of internal forces in his brain? Or was it the result of molding by external forces of experience and, and, and things he had learnt? Nevertheless, management questions have been forced to, uh, to be answered in the meantime. And they relate to when can a child, given his childish brain, when can a child be held accountable for his or her actions? And uh, can that accountability be generalized and related to a particular age, uh, leading to the construction of relevant uh, laws? In Australia, uh, recognizing the childish brain, uh, the minimal age of criminal responsibility um, is uh, 10 years of age, between the ages of 10 and 14 years, it's presumed a child is incapable of committing a criminal act and can only be convicted if the prosecution can prove the child could distinguish between right and wrong. Older than that, from 14 to either 17 or 18 years, depending on the state, Adolescents may be held responsible for criminal acts, but are subject to a different range of penalties compared to adults. Some other countries in Europe, for example, have got higher ages uh, for accountability. 
in Australia, recognizing the personal trouble uh, that the possession of an immature brain can inflict on its holder, the legal age for consensual sex is at least 16 and 17 years across various states. The legal age for driving is 16, joining the army is 17, and 18 for consumption of alcohol and for gambling. In other words, uh, clearly, uh, the legislature does not, and the legislation does not entirely trust the immature brain of childhood and adolescent uh, to be able to come up with mature decision making. However, in Australia, uh, there's no limit, no age limit uh, for the receipt of affirmation therapy for children and adolescents who are convinced their gender is incongruent with chromosomes. In other words, this is giving uh, permission for social affirmation. Then the administration of hormones uh, that block puberty, and then uh, for administration of cross-sex hormones that evoke the external uh, ersatz appearance of, of the opposite sex, the desired new sex, and in fact lead on to uh, intrusive surgery. Though the age was for joining the army at, is 18 in Australia, uh, girls as young as 15 were, according to the report, uh, the court reports, two girls at 15 years of age and two at 16 and two at 17 uh, thus far have had their breasts removed. Since the court abrogated its responsibility for those decisions and open slather, uh, we, don't, we no longer know. Um, we no longer know how often that is occurring. So there is uh, no age limit to that. And as in the UK, uh, credence is uh, given to the possession of so-called Gillick competence, uh, which is derived from a decision in the British House of Lords uh, relating to the right of a minor to receive contraceptives. So Mrs. Gillick was protesting the practice of provision of contraceptives to her daughters under the age of 16. Uh, but the House uh, concluded that the child's capacity increases as they approach maturity. In other words, the authority of a parent decreases as their child's capacity increases, and it ceases when the child is uh, perceived or believed uh, to have achieved a sufficient understanding and intelligence to enable him or her to understand what is proposed. So this is referred uh, as Gillick competent or a mature minor. Getting back to the affirmation therapy uh, here in Australia, the Australian standards of care and the treatment of guidelines of the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne have no age limits for the administration of blockers or cross sex hormones. The, they argue in their standards of care that their administration is given in the best interests of the child as decided by attending uh, medical staff uh, with con informed consent of parents or carers regarding cross-sex hormones uh, perhaps even more intrusive, they are given a so-called best interests of the adolescent uh, with informed consent. So let's just go over this Gillick competence because what we're going to do is look at recent findings in physiology to see whether it's reasonable to assume that the development of a teenage brain is in fact capable of making these decisions. So it depends, Gilly competence depends on the maturity of the child. That basically means the ability to understand and that understanding would take account of the child's experiences and ability to manage influences on their decision-making, such as information, peer pressure, which is very, very important, family pressure, fear and misgivings, they say. Depends also on the child's intelligence intelligence and takes account of the child's understanding, ability to weigh risk and benefit, 
consideration of longer term factors, such as an effect on family life and such things as schooling. The question is, does the physiological, is there a physiological basis in this childish brain uh, to substantiate the claim that this, this so-called Gilly competence really exists? Now, herein, uh, research in recent decades in the functional development of the brain uh, provides insight and, to my mind, uh, casts much doubt. So what's happened in recent years, the MRI has, 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 has increased wondrously, um, permitting uh, not only delineation of structures within the brain, uh, but because of differing magnetic properties between oxygenated and unoxygenated hemoglobin, um, it, uh, it, it is able to um, it is able to interrogate would be a word uh, the function that's happening, especially the connectivity between uh, various parts of the brain, how they're talking to each other, crosstalk within the various centers within the brain, and also delineating, as we said, the size and the, the, uh, the morphology of those subcenters. So thus, um, it has been found that while the brain reaches approximately 90% of its adult size by six years, nevertheless, it undergoes extensive remodeling from 12 years of age to young adulthood. This is the time when uh, where St. Paul is moving from childish things to manhood things. These MRI interrogations have shown that each lobe undergoes changes in the composition of gray and white matter, in its connections with other lobes, as we've talked about, and its hormonal environment. And, and What's important for our argument, it does this in accordance with its own timeline. So what is the timeline? Well, the white matter increases, according to the MRI studies, in a roughly linear manner uh, through childhood and adolescence uh, in the major lobes, uh, representing the wrapping by oligodendrocytes of the axons of neurons within the sheaths of myelin, permitting the transmission of message uh, at speeds of up to a hundred times those of unmyelinated, uh, unmyelinated axons. I tell you what, it's enough to make you believe in creation, quite frankly, all this stuff. Gray matter reflecting neuronal content uh, is found in two locations, as you probably know. Uh, cortical on the outer side of the brain uh, or the subcortical deeper inside, which is essentially basal ganglia and the limbic system. Now, this more complicated, the gray matter, um, from about six years of age, the cortical gray matter, that the most exterior one, follows an inverted U pattern, according to the reports, thickening in accordance with the size and complexity of neurons. Uh, in other words, as the neurons developed, uh, the, gray mat the, the volume of the gray matter increased. But then that thinned after that in an inverted U fashion, the volume thinned or was reduced uh, because of pruning. Um, of the various dendri dendrites and other intercellular connections, and also for, for cells, brain cells, uh, which were considered redundant, but it was no significant influence on the number of cells, number of neuron cells that were there. So many internal and external factors were subsequently shown to influence that pruning uh, from genetics to control it, to environmental exposure, including nutrition, uh, toxin, drugs like marijuana, and hormones, and now we're getting very relevant now, especially those hormones involved in the stress reaction uh, to adverse experiences in life. These are called attachment experiences, 
and uh, reckon to uh, inflict upon the brain a pathological template uh, of post-traumatic stress disorder uh, that persists throughout life. Now, clearly, if the child had that, uh, then their ability to move from childish things is going to be limited. In the subcortical gray matter of the limbic system, the basal ganglia, there's been more difficult for the uh, investigators to quantitate it, uh, but because of technical reasons. But as a whole, uh, basal ganglia and the associated limbic system uh, being integral to emotion, language, memory, and mediating higher cognitive functions and attention and affective states is very, very important to the way the child is going to think uh, and what, what decision is being made um, as this then matures. With age, uh, it's been found that the amygdala uh, increased in size in males, uh, while the hippocampus increased only in females. And these were presumably in response to the external effects of, of sex-specific hormones. How do I know that? Because gonadectomized, gonadectomized female rats, rats have been shown to have a lower density of spines, dendritic spines, and increased, increased, uh, decreased number of fibers in the hippocampus. And this was alleviated by hormone replacement. So you can see that in this process of puberty, the the sex hormones themselves are organizing and activating a brain in accordance with the way it was all set out even before birth. Now, it needs to be firmly understood that the as parts of the prefrontal cortex, gray matter, don't reach final maturation until the mid 20s. It's very important. The maturation of the cortical gray matter proceeds from a posterior to an anterior direction. Therefore, motor and sensory function matures first, but this integrating thinking part, which is linked to the, and I'm quoting, the ability to inhibit impulses coming from the subcortical areas, the thalamus and the emotional centers. Uh, and this is the part, the prefrontal part, weighs consequences of decisions and it prioritizes and strategizes uh, programs for life. So um, it's also found that parts of the limbic system, that subcortical bit which drives emotion and which is controlled by the prefrontal cortex, parts of the limbic system are incompletely myelinated as well until the mid-20s. And in that process, are incompletely connected to the frontal cortex. In other words, the emotional center of the limbic system is poorly connected to the judgment center in the prefrontal cortex. What does this lead to? Results in the likelihood, obviously, of decisions being made on emotional grounds, unmodified by judgment. Thus, and I'm quoting one of the authors of these studies, I'm quoting, thus he says, executive function, that's the decision making, uh, and emotional responses are not just less developed or different in teenagers. These two capacities are also less clo closely linked than in the typical adult brain. As a result, he says, a teen may intellectually understand an issue and emotionally have a response to that issue, but these two processes may occur in parallel rather than in dialogue. And he says, obviously, that emotional and executive functions must work together to bring about almost any kind of decision. That's fairly obvious. What the point of this is, is that um, the decision-making uh, process is not linked to the driving emotional process. The, the decision-making process may understand the logic of the argument, but the emotional process supersedes it. In other words, 
giving uh, permission, for example, to have your breasts removed, the, the girl may well understand the complications of having your breasts removed, the medical complications. But this, then she may still decide to do all this uh, because of this emotional turmoil within her with regard to gender dysphoria. Another author there, um, he, uh, he, he, he used, he came up with different words, which is helpful actually. His name is Diekma, and he emphasized this lack of concordance between cortical and subcortical centers. And he said that that's between the cognitive control center, his words, of the prefrontal lobe uh, and the socio-emotional system of the limbic and paralimbic system. That's just what we've been talking about. He says the former tends to be consciously controlled, volitional, deliberate, reasoned, analytic and reflective, requiring more, I'm quoting still, time and conscious effort, more time and conscious effort to come to the decision rather than the social emotional system, which tends to involve rapid automatic processing, often reactive, intuitive, unconscious, picking up patterns before uh, the individual may be aware of them and motivating behavior changes through feelings and autonomic responses. In other words, what we would recognize as a, a characteristic adolescent behavior. So noting that the systems that cognitive system in the forebrain and the emotional system in the limbic system proceed along different trajectories uh, with socio-emotional one maturing with puberty and the cognitive control during the mid-20s, 10 years later, uh, Diekma rather appropriately talks about uh, that he de declares adolescents experience what may be called a prefrontal cortex deficit disorder. It's very quite almost funny if it wasn't so serious. So in this prefrontal cortex deficit disorder uh, is characterized by, uh, well, the ability to regulate and understand emotions in themselves and others remains undeveloped. Susceptibility to peer pressure influence is greater. The ability to delay rewards is limited. Um, and adolescents and young adults are more likely than adults, and we know this, to engage in a variety of risky behaviors from binge drinking, smoking, casual sex, violence, or criminal behavior and dangerous driving. Other people have taken this uh, allusion even, in a way, even better. Um, the cognitive control system has been likened to a cold process compared to the hot emotional process. And Yekma himself implies that cognitive decisions made in a cold environment by a 14 year old may not be those made in the heat of an emotionally charged circumstances. Uh, uh, and he concludes, and this is very controversial, because this is really controversial. He says that this inability, this discordance, this lack of concordance between the centers leads him to conclude that as a general rule, adolescents may require limits on the kinds of decisions they are allowed to make. This is very controversial. He concludes the current age of majority, 18 to 21 years in various US states, is not clearly supported by empirical data, at least for some decisions. It may well be that the age of majority should be reconsidered the data established fairly clearly that most adolescents under that age have not yet attained a level of brain maturation that justifies treating them like, adult, like adults with respect to significant, potentially life-altering 
healthcare decisions. So um, moving on from things then that are different, we've just talked about the different rates of maturation in parts of brains. There are other things uh, that are occurring in a timely in a, in a sequence, in maturing sequence. Uh, they're affecting the brain and therefore the ability of an adolescent to decide. So there are changes in hormones and neurotransmitters. We've already mentioned that uh, both testosterone and estrogen have receptors in the brain. And the advent then of the sex hormones with puberty leads to organizing and activating patterns that have been set down before birth. Um, there is a complex system that you may recall uh, that uh, arises in the hypothalamus with the release of gonadotrophin releasing hormone and that acts on the pituitary to release follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone and that causes the release of the uh, of the sex hormones it's that gnrh the gonadotrophin releasing hormone which is going to be blocked uh, in affirmation to a new agenda with consequent uh, reduction then of and of abolition of the sex hormones. But what's also being found now um, is that above the GnRH, which is formed in the hypothalamus and released from there, it has a, at the pinnacle, well, almost at the pinnacle of this cascade, a new transmitter has emerged, kispeptin. And it then causes um, the release of the GnRH. And what am I getting in here? All these neurotransmitters then are involved in gender identity. In other words, what, how the, the person's worldview of themselves and their rel relatedness to other people, um, and they're related to sexualization by effects of the brain. And these come about in progressive strength through puberty. No wonder the capacity of the brain and the capacity to identify yourself uh, changes in that period. And then uh, we should not forget uh, the neurotransmitter dopamine, uh, which is most responsible for feelings of pleasure. And it too is affected by brain changes in adolescence. Uh, during maturation, its levels in this prefrontal cortex are not matched by those in the limbic system. So this suggests that the adolescent requires more excitement, more stimulation to achieve the same level of pleasure as an adult, thus risking, uh, thus provoking risky behavior or being the neurobiological uh, basis for immature behavior. So secretion of dopamine, as you would know, is also basic to addiction, uh, hence the proclivity to various forms of addiction in adolescence. Now, we're getting back to their relevance to significant, potentially life-altering healthcare decisions. That's where, that's where this is leading in that sense. Um, there can be no greater significant potentially life-altering healthcare decision than that of changing your gender or and therefore going through the social, hormonal and surgical affirmation of an adolescent uh, to a gender incongruent, incongruent with chromosomes. So uh, not only in making of this decision, is there lack of concordance between parts of the brain, but other factors are also involved that would interfere with mature decision-making in an adolescent. The first, with regard to gender affirmation, is its known association with, it, with other neurodevelopmental comorbidities. In the Tavistock debacle, I, it, I read that up to a third of their children who were going undergoing affirmation also suffered from autism. And we know that decision-making is impaired by that disordered brain <clears throat> underneath it that's associated with autism. Similarly, 
uh, most children who are seeking affirmation in a different uh, gender are known to be suffering from some kind of comorbid mental disorder uh, as opposed to neuro neurodevelopmental disorder of autism. So there's anxiety, depression, and even frank psychosis, including anorexia nervosa. Um, and these things also then affect the ability to make mature decisions. You can't make a mature decision for your life if you're bed bound, bed bound uh, with anxiety. So, and also another thing which has been found to be prevalent in children who are confused over their gender, and that is disruption, disruption of early attachment, uh, attachment deficit to parents or primary uh, child carers in the early years uh, is now reckoned to have lasting neurobiological effects. Uh, summarizing these effects, uh, one investigator reported that there is continued disruption in metabolism in regions involved in stress regulations, including the orbitofrontal cortex and its innovation and connectivity with the limbic system. This is what we've been talking about. Yet here is another insult inflicting chronic damage uh, on this decision-making capacity. And it's reflected in the fact that many children who are gender confused are known now to have had uh, attachment difficulties uh, at earlier an earlier age. And then we haven't talked about it yet is the effect, the structural effect of alcohol, marijuana and other drugs, uh, all of which are likely to affect this neurobiological balance of cognition and emotion. So we've got to hurry on a bit here. The second factor um, that affects the ability of adolescents to make reasoned decisions and this pertains to Tavistock um, and other children's uh, gender services, is that if you want a child to, to even begin to make a reasoned decision, you have to give them reasoned, reasonable information. That's like the old thing of the computer, uh, rubbish in, rubbish out. In other words, if you don't provide the child with adequate information, you can't possibly expect them to make an adequate decision. And consistently, in, for example, uh, in the gender identity disservice based in Tavistock, is the sustained failure to acknowledge the proven side effects of blockers and cross-sections. I know that because uh, I was provided with the information that is or the, the lack of information uh, that Tavistock was giving for people as part of a preparation or of a submission that I made to that, uh, that court proceedings. So moving on for other factors, um, uh, uh, fa factors then, there's a third factor that would influence decision-making is the degree of peer pressure inflicted on an adolescent during the need for affirmation or whatever he was doing. Uh, gender dysphoria is described as a social contagion, moving cat like a, an epidemic, a contagious business. Um, uh, but the but the peer pressure, once it is begun, is appears to be so great that it is very difficult for the child to step off the escalator and proceeds from social affirmation to subsequent hormonal stages. Now, this, this pressure um, and the investigators on the effect of the limbic system brought all this out. Uh, this pressure includes peers, but often parents, certainly social media, media, now much legislation, for example, in Australia, and even pressure involved in public acceptance and promotion of aspects of gender dysphoria uh, or the need for affirmation in Christian schools. The fourth factor is the blocking of the hormone GnRH near the apex of that cascade we were talking about. So animal studies conducted in Glasgow, for example, and other parts of the world have shown that uh, if you block 
the GnRH, it leads to a morphological change. And in other words, a neurobiological change um, in the recipient. Sheep who were blocked in puberty showed that their limbic system, the morphology of the limbic system was hypertrophied. And when they looked at the function of genes, they found that many, the function of many, many of the genes in the limbic system, this is the system that can generate and controls emotion, memory, behavior, and so forth. The, the function of many of the genes was interrupted. What happened to the sheep? They were much more emotionally labile because it affected the limbic system and the hippocampus. Their spatial memory uh, was, um, was interfered with. And because of the fearfulness, the emotional ability, uh, there was a fearful preference for the familiar things in life rather than the novel. Now, how does this fit in with gender dysphoria? Because the familiar in a child who has undergone social affirmation uh, is the acceptance socially of the new gender. That's the familiar. The concept of being able to change that for the novel I, I, idea of, well, hang on, I'm not really the girl that I thought I was because I've got testicles. Uh, that's a novel concept. And being shown this capacity, uh, this preference for the familiar has been shown in both sheep and uh, rodents, for example. Um, it gives a neurobiological basis for the imperfection of decision making. So how can we conclude this? Uh, others have concluded um, that there's lack of concordance between those two centers is a maturity gap. Uh, that should be recognized and that uh, adolescents uh, suffer from unhealthy decisions that are enforced upon them or that they make during that period, that gap period, which St. Paul talked about the thinking of childhood, child, childhood, childish things. Uh, but now in society, certainly in Australia, certain very strong forces empowered by legislation, and even, I can't help saying this, blessed by sections of our church, uh, forces are allowed to be prevailing upon that gap that relate to the behavior of children. The prevailing doctrine in the Victorian state legislation declares no sexual behavior represents a weakness or a defect or certainly a sin. And it promises up to 10 years in jail for anyone attempting to change or suppress such appetites. So that the law is basically uh, forcing uh, sexual liberation, um, allowing uh, what the Bible would talk, would consider unusual sexual practices. Uh, these things are exonerated, indeed encouraged by legislature, and uh, and are impinging upon children in Australia at least, but I suspect elsewhere, in schools, where from kindergarten uh, children are exposed to skilled presentations that inform the child that is not necessarily the boy or the girl they thought they were, or what was claimed that they were and that sexuality and its practices should not be confined to a Judeo-Christian worldview. Or even that the change of gender need to have parental approval. The state will provide the way for you. This, these messages are amplified on our media uh, between advertisements for alcohol and gambling, and marijuana is declared medicinal uh, by doctors' organizations. The thing is that uh, the phenomenon that, uh, that confronts us, at least in Australia, of uh, these, these things is that the messages of this kind of sexual liberation and so forth are not bringing liberation. According to a recent article or review in The Lancet, uh, youth in the Western world, at least, is in fact afflicted 
by mental disorder at an alarming and unprecedented rate for, according to the uh, Lancet, for unknown reasons. So what's our challenge as Christians? Our challenge is the delivery of the message of the cross along with its uh, social restrictions, its need for control of the limbic system uh, in order to preserve society in which everybody can benefit. Um, and its message, its underlying message, that there is indeed a life worth living and that there is no need to succumb uh, to the quagmire of anxiety and depression and so forth, uh, largely encouraged by messages from society impinging upon, in my opinion, um, the sensitive brain of an adolescent in that maturity gap, which then leads to imperfect decisions of identity and behavior. In, I've been around for a while, I'm well past my retirement date, quite frankly, um, and I have never really seen uh, such a need for the liberation message of Jesus Christ and with its imputa imputation that there is indeed a life uh, of worth living, a high, of higher quality, uh, of greater interest, of greater satisfaction, than just living for yourself in a quagmire of imperfect decisions. Well, that's it, Peter. Brilliant. Thank you very much. We've been listening to, to John, John Whitehall from uh, Sydney, Professor Whitehall speaking on the subject of the, the teenage brain, its maturation and uh, the relevance particularly to the debate on gender dysphoria uh, that's going on at the moment. So I've got a question. The first question here is anonymous, John, but um, it's just saying thank you for your presentation and particularly your critical analysis of the concept of Gillick competence uh, and that famous court, court case in the UK. And the fact that there may not be a yet identifiable functional substrate on MRI uh, for this doesn't mean that the concept itself is suspect, even if it was developed in the context of underage sexual activity and access to contraception. So that's his opening. But he's, he's asking a question about spiritual decision making. You, you quote from the Apostle Paul referring in its context to spiritual growth. Would you want to defend that as, as a teenager or an adolescent is incapable of spiritual decision making, specifically thinking of the age we'd expect them to be able to make a considered profession of faith, um, uh, relating perhaps to baptism or arguably uh, a weightier decision than one relating to medical treatment, which would equally require the intellectual and emotional faculties you mentioned to be in harmony. So it's just raised this question of, of um, you know, big faith decisions made by teenagers. Do you think that this is relevant? I, th I think it's very relevant, yes, um, because I think it takes the focus of their narcissism um, and their imperfection of decision-making uh, it takes it away from there and leads to a purpose in life uh, which is beyond themselves. Um, and uh, it, it leads to a transformation in values. It, 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 imports, it, it imparts tuition. And that's one of the things that is lacking in the gender business. They're not telling them about the side effects. Okay, so what becoming a Christian and studying the Bible does is it illuminates uh, the concept of the necessity for restraint uh, in order uh, for personal and societal benefit. I mean, that's the essence, uh, much of the essence of the Ten Commandments. Uh, we are not to do this. We have practiced restraint, sexual restraint. We're not to steal other people's things. So as restraint regarding other people's property and all those sorts of things. Uh, this is uh, as well as 
as well as declaring we should be worshiping God, it, it's also giving us very practical uh, laws for behavior. Um, and I think that we can't make decisions with or for behavior. An adolescent can't make decisions unless there is an alternate view. So we Christians would have an alternate view that uh, sexual promiscuity, for example, is going to be damaging one way or another uh, to you uh, or to society, uh, and therefore uh, the Bible teaches uh, restraint. So I think there's a, an enormous responsibility. That's kind of what I was trying to get at. There's an enormous responsibility for us to impart the biblical teachings uh, for the rules for living, but more, more than that, the, the promise of a better life, a higher life, not confined in your own feelings, but in accordance with the feelings of Jesus Christ. I mean, I think that's the issue here. The limbic system is one of feelings. And these days, particularly with gender dysphoria, if you feel like you're a boy, well, and you're not, you're a girl, well, then, okay, you can become it. It's according with your feelings. Mm -hmm. I think that the biblical teaching rescues us from focus on our own feelings and transports it <clears throat> into uh, service for him and, and other people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Stephen Willing is, is asking here, According to research, the immature brain is also highly malleable. Would you care to comment on the significance of cerebral plasticity in this arena? They often say that neuroplasticity is related to the damaging effects of, of uh, addiction, don't they? That by following certain thoughts and patterns of behavior, you can actually end up altering uh, sometimes irreparably the structure of your brain. In, in the future but would you like to comment on neuroplasticity no well i when i was a lad uh, no one knew or believed in neuroplasticity we, we believed in those days that if you were damaged that was the end of it but um, it has been shown it has been demonstrated to exist one of the roles of gnrh which we block in order to uh, change the gender one of the roles of GnRH apparently is to encourage uh, the generation of new nerve cells, uh, new neurons, uh, particularly yeah. perhaps in the hippocampus, which is associated then in the limbic system. So I don't. I mean, a physiotherapist believe in this that if you if you use physiotherapy early, you can overcome. Uh, strictures of of some of the strictures of cerebral palsy. So yes, I I am convinced that this works, um, and I am very astonished in general at the capacity of the human body to regenerate itself. And I'm optimistic uh, that um, that plasticity can occur in attachment syndromes, for example. Now clearly, you need to be supporting the child and so forth. Um, and you need to be imparting positive messages and positive love and support um, uh, to get around that, to allow for a time of healing. But yes, I, I am optimistic about plasticity. Ultimately, there would be some, some degree beyond which uh, improvement couldn't occur, but I, we haven't established that yet. John, you've made an incredibly good case for the, the potential for both um, puberty blockers and sex hormones to, um, you know, to alter the development of the brain. Um, is, are there any uh, longer term studies yet to show adverse effects from the use of puberty blockers and cross sex hormones? in treating gender dysphoria, or, or is it still early days? Well, there, there's certainly, certainly studies have been done uh, with their effects on, uh, on sheep and rodents. But, and I shouldn't mention names here, one of the most prominent uh, re research institutions that showed this deleterious, lasting, sustained effect 
uh, of blocking GNRH, it has received no further funding uh, to continue what would be logical exploration. And in particular, they wanted to look at the effects of the cross-sex hormones on the growing brain, but they received, and they put up a very, very logical um, request, uh, but were knocked back by funding, by the institutional funding organization. So I, I'm not susceptible to conspiracy theories, but I think, I think that there is, these things are, diff, I mean, it's very difficult to get the funding for them. The research which is undertaken is observational. Although we'll give the child a blocker, we'll see what happens. But, and it's not controlled for major confounders. For example, it is the observer who is giving it. The observer's career depends upon a good result. And the, there's a posse of people who are coming in to make that child feel that they made the right decision. Social workers, counselors, a whole blah, 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 a whole team of adults coming in. Now, A, that is very supporting to a child who has had attachment injury and is chronically depressed and anxiety and alone and confused and so forth. To have a whole posse of adults on your side is by itself a confounder. Um, and that's the first thing. The second thing is, it requires, therefore, an enormous determination, time and energy of the prefrontal cortex to make the decision, well, hang on, uh, I'm now going to change my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, despite all the positive emotional feelings I, my, and feelings of reward, love and comfort and everything that my, my, uh, my much emotional part of my brain is receiving, I am going to make a cold, hard, calculated decision to move away from that. This becomes impossible. There is no reasonable. This is an experiment that, that confounds all the rules that were brought out in Nuremberg uh, after the Second World War. This is plain, straightforward, uncontrolled, unregulated experimentation on the vulnerable brains of teenagers. You, you started off in your talk you know, ma making a good, a good case arguing about the uh, different ages of consent for whether it's sexual acts or taking alcohol, joining, joining the army, voting, and so on. Uh, you know, why, why is it, do you think, that society seems to make a lot of sensible decisions about these, taking into account the immaturity of the teenage brain, but when it comes to the issue of gender dysphoria, it's almost as though we're suspending our rational faculties in, in, in using the gender affirming approach that, that's being pushed. What, what, why, why, why is it? My, my opinion is that this represents, this blindness, uh, this determine, the determination represents a utopian ideology, uh, which has effectively said yes to the temptations that Jesus said no to, um, and perceives that it has the power, um, like Jesus, throw yourself and nothing's going to happen. Uh, Jesus was the power above uh, gravity, for example, and other physical things. Here, they believe they have the power uh, greater than the chromosome, and when Jesus was invited to look out, you hear, here's the whole of history. Of, you can see the imperfection at the beginning, and you can see the utopia at the end. I'll give it to you, um, said the devil, if you worship me. Um, I think this is a utopian conclusion here, that they believe that uh, the imperfection, seen that, um, yeah, imperfection um, is caused by, for example, sexual restraint. Um, gender restraint, uh, mm -hmm. these sorts of things are perceived as sin, and the great process of salvation towards uh, the utopian future depends upon them and their and this ideology. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that seeing it in that light of saying yes to the three temptations, and of course the first temptation here. 
do you hunger eat this i think is relates to what is man that this man that you have come down to seek and to save basically is an animal who can be treated uh, in sort with veterinary uh, veterinary ethics um, or is he something different and jesus of course said no no he he is different he, he is uh, not just an animal so i i think that the saying yes to these three temptations gives me anyway an understanding of the ideological power of this of this um of this force and that's allowed it to prevail one way or another it's a contagious power uh, through legislation in many countries mm. and unfortunately uh unfortunately steeping into churches mm. John, thank you so much. And sadly, we've run out of time. Now, there are lots of other questions I would have liked to put to you. Um, but thank you so much for your time and for opening this up to us in such an accessible way. And we look forward to seeing you again soon on ICMDA webinars. God bless you.